Hello, my name is Didier Steny. I'm a director of the Max Planck Institute for Heart and Lung Research in Bad Nauheim, Germany. And today, in this third part, we're going to be talking about the phenomenon of genetic compensation in the context of vascular development in the zebrafish embryo. Historically, gene function in zebrafish has been studied initially through a full genetic approach, merely for mutagenizing the genome, introducing uh, mutations randomly, and then uh, doing phenotypic screening. Uh, more recently, morpholinos, antisense oligos, have been used to knock down gene function. And then more recently, just a few years ago, using zinc finger nucleases as well as Talens and the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, mutations have been introduced in specific genes to study not only genes that were studied uh, previously using morpholinos, but also other genes. And the studies that I'll be telling you about today were essentially inspired by the fact that uh, looking at uh, specific genes that have been studied both using morpholinos as well as uh, reverse genetic techniques, it became apparent that in many cases, the phenotypes induced by mutations were much milder than those induced by the morpholino technology. And so essentially, just to give you a little background, morpholinos are, as you can see here, modified oligos. They're highly stable. They're by an RNA. They're used to block either translation or splicing. And so the question then is why mutant phenotypes are, in fact, often milder than antisense phenotypes. So mutant phenotypes versus antisense phenotypes. I will also be using the word morphant uh, for morpholino-induced. So we'll be talking about mutant versus morphant phenotype. And uh, mutants are often referred to as knockouts and antisense as knockdowns. So let's uh, start by some uh, history of uh, antisense approach, antisense technology. And more than 30 years ago, people working in developmental biology were using or started using antisense RNA to essentially block gene function. This is both in the context of the frog embryo as well as the fly embryo. But this period was fairly short-lived, probably because people were concerned about off-target effects. And so people moved to now overexpressing either wild type or dominant negative versions of uh, genes or proteins. And essentially, for example, in this case, uh, dominant negative uh, activin receptor uh, certainly was known and, uh, to interfere with other proteins uh, besides the activin receptor. And yet, approaches such as this gave us important insights into developmental processes. And so it's important to realize that uh, while no reagent is perfect, certainly uh, these reagents can be used to make uh, important uh, insights into biological pr uh, processes. And uh, in uh, zebrafish, uh, this antisense technology using the morpholinos was introduced in 2000, at the same time as it was introduced in the frog. And a few years later, a number of guidelines were written up, essentially, to try and, as best as people could, essentially control for these uh, morpholino studies, and specifically trying to avoid uh, and recognize off-target effects. And so, essentially, uh, with this in mind, uh, and as I said, as the uh, various uh, reverse genetics techniques became available, people started seeing essentially important differences between the mutation-induced phenotypes and the morpholino, or antisense-induced phenotypes. And this was uh, further emphasized by a larger study from Nathan Larson's lab, where they essentially looked at a large number of genes and, again, found a poor correlation between morpholino-induced and mutant phenotypes in zebrafish. And so, essentially, this is not specific, I should mention, to the zebrafish field. In fact, if you now look at uh, antisense work in the mouse, this is now using transgenesis to drive antisense uh, tra transcripts, Essentially, again, you see a more severe phenotypes from the antisense approach than from the uh, mutation approach. And so it's clearly a question that uh, spans beyond or goes beyond just using morpholinos and uh, probably applies to all antisense uh, work. So we decided to revisit this issue in uh, detail, and we picked this gene called EGFR7 for a number of reasons, but mostly because 
in three different settings using the anti-sense approach, this gene had been implicated in a, uh, playing an important role in vascular development. This was in zebrafish, in frog, as well as in human and athesia cells. And yet, in the mouse mutant, there was no phenotype, no discernible phenotype. Just to give you a little background about this gene, it encodes an ECM protein. It's expressed mainly by endothelial cells, and it's apparently expressed by tumor cells in uh, human cancers, and for this reason was the uh, drug target uh, in uh, Genentech, in fact, had a, a clinical trial for one of the humanized monoclonal antibody against this protein. So as I mentioned, in zebrafish, uh, where the first work was done on this gene, when you knock down EGFR7, Using morpholino, you see severe defects in a number of processes, including vascular tube formation, and you also get uh, pericardial edema, indicative of uh, a failing heart. Similar uh, phenotype was seen in the frog embryo, again, using an antisense uh, approach, and uh, also, well, as in human yes cells, human endothelial cells. And as I mentioned, the, uh, in the contrast, uh, to these uh, studies, to these findings, the mouse mutant was in fact phenotypically normal. Now, this was a little um, complicated initially by the fact that there is a, in the EGFR7 locus, as you can see here, there is a microRNA, a microRNA-126 embedded in this locus. And this microRNA is also expressed in endothelial cells. And so, in fact, the original mutant that was made deleted this microRNA as well. And this led to the appearance of uh, vascular phenotypes. But in fact, when uh, uh, specific knockouts, specific mutations were made, either in the microRNA or EGFR7 gene itself, it uh, was uh, realized that in fact the microRNA was the one responsible for the phenotype seen in the original mutant. So essentially, the uh, bottom line is that we have a, a severe phenotypes using antisense technology in the you know, fish, frog, and the human cells, but no phenotype in the mouse. And so we went on to make a using now tailing technology uh, in the EGFR7 mutants. And uh, we uh, identified a number of mutant alleles and uh, focused on two alleles. One is the delta-3, which removes the proline. Another one is the delta-4 that leads to a, a premature stop codon. And this is the main allele, mutant allele, that we'll be using for the rest of the study. And we used uh, high-resolution melt analysis to develop a, a, a very rigorous uh, and reproducible uh, genotyping protocol, which, as you'll see, is uh, essential for the studies I'll be telling you about. So the, uh, much like the mouse mutant, uh, in fact, the uh, zebrafish mutant shows a very mild, if any, phenotypes. Only about 5% of the mutants show this uh, transient hemorrhage that you can see here in the head of a mutant, but essentially looking at uh, both the uh, trunk as well as the head vasculature, essentially one uh, sees no uh, discernible uh, or no major phenotype. We also made and analyzed maternal zygotic mutants. And uh, again, uh, these were uh, mutants, these maternal zygotic mutants did not show a more severe phenotype than just the zygotic uh, mutants. So essentially, as I said, we now have a situation where the mutants in zebrafish, much like the mutants in the mouse, show very mild vascular defects, if any. Only about 5% of mutants show this defect. But as you can see here, again, uh, from the original data using the anti-sense technology, we have both severe vascular defects, uh, vascular tube defects, that is, so defects in vascular genesis, as well as defect in angiogenesis that leads to the sprouting of new vessels. So essentially, we have, uh, as has been seen, observed for several other genes now, we have profound phenotypic differences between the EGFR7 mutants and the EGFR7 morphins. And one can think about uh, a number of simple or trivial explanations why that would be. It's possible that the mutant allele we had made was a hypomorph. And it's also possible that the morpholino that had been used for these studies were inducing off-target effects. And this is the phenotypes that uh, essentially people had been looking at. It's also possible that there was a more a interesting observation. And so we decided to uh, look further and try and understand the discrepancy between the mutant and the morphine phenotype. So essentially, 
the first question then is, uh, is the mutation a null allele? And uh, you might think this is a simple uh, question to answer, but in fact the genome has come up with many different ways to uh, bypass uh, mutations, especially mutations that lead to uh, uh, stop codons, premature stop codons in the 5' end of the gene. So for example, uh, it's been observed now several times that uh, downstream ATGs or even non-ATG uh, codons can be used for reinitiation or translation. We can, uh, we've also observed, and I'll show you in a minute, uh, exon skipping. And then in terms of secreted proteins like EGFR7, uh, certainly one can also uh, imagine scenarios where unconventional uh, secretion pathways are used for truncated uh, proteins, for example. Let me show you an example of exon skipping, again, that's uh, been observed uh, several times in the field. And in this case, we made mutations in exon 2. And as you can see, again, here, these are now two different mutations. There's a mutation uh, 1 and mutation 2. And in the mutant, you can see, uh, essentially, there right here, that uh, there's a smaller band that's also present in terzygous, and this band comes from the uh, skipping of uh, hexon 2, as you can see there. So there's essentially, as I said, <clears throat> many ways by, uh, for, by which the genome can uh, circumvent uh, what looks to be uh, severe lesions. So in terms of uh, our lesion, our Delta-4 uh, mutation specifically, what we did is uh, first look at uh, the RNA levels, as shown here, and you can see there's a reduction in the delta-4 allele compared to wild-type or the delta-3 allele. So there's a, about 50% reduction in the transcript level, possibly through non-sensitive decay. If you look at the uh, protein, we express both the wild-type and the mutant protein in cells. And as it is a secreted protein, you can see that uh, most of the wild-type protein is present in the medium. If you look at the mutant protein, you can see there's a reduction in the level of expression, but you can see very little protein, in fact, secreted. So these two data together suggest that uh, this allele, this delta-4 allele that uh, we had generated, could, in fact, uh, be a severe allele. How about the uh, second question? What about off-target effects caused by morpholinos? Now, in order to do this, we're going to be injecting the morpholino into this mutant allele that we made. And essentially, the reasoning here is that if this allele, this mutant allele, is a null, the morpholino, any additional phenotypes that's seen from morpholino injection sh should, by definition, be enough target effect. So essentially, before we do that, before we inject this morpholino into the uh, EGFR7 mutants, we want first to introduce a MIC tag in the EGFR7 locus, again, by uh, gene editing uh, following uh, cleavage by tailings. And this is to allow us to look at the efficiency of the morpholino at different doses. And so uh, by Western blood analysis then, after injecting one nanogram of this morpholino into these transgenic embryos, one can see in fact there's about an 80% reduction of protein levels, EGFL protein levels, using one nanogram morpholino. We chose this uh, dose of one nanogram because if you inject uh, higher doses, as you can see here, you essentially induce the expression of p53, which has been uh, a, a reported to be indicative of an off-target effect from morpholino injections. And so essentially, one nanogram does not cause p53 induction, but uh, two will, and so we stuck with one nanogram. So essentially now we are ready for the experiment, so we're going to be injecting this EGFR morpholino into EGFR7 mutants in the following manner. We're going to be crossing heads, injecting one nanogram of the morpholino, and then taking 32 affected embryos and genotype them. And so let's uh, first look at the various scenarios uh, that are uh, in the uh, outcomes of uh, what we want to predict. So essentially, if the mutant allele is not null, then the mutant embryo should be more sensitive than the wild type to the morpholino injections. Let's say, for example, there's 20% gene function left. You, uh, you inject the morpholino at one nanogram, the mutant embryo should be more sensitive. If the mutant is null and the morpholino phenotype is due to off-target effects, then essentially the genotype of the embryo should not matter. The mutant and wild type embryos should be equally sensitive to the morpholino injections. <clears throat> 
However, if the mutant is null, and the morpholinal phenotype is not due to off-target effects, then the mutant embryo should be less sensitive than the wild type to the morpholinal injections. And this is exactly, in fact, what we saw. So we, uh, as I said, genotype 32 affected embryos, and uh, we would expect, uh, through Mendelian segregation, eight of them to be mutants, but in fact, we only found three of them here, shown in this red curves. And so this indicates that, in fact, the EGFR7 mutants are less sensitive. They are somewhat protective, protected to the EGFR7 morpholino. And so, in fact, these are the data now, different experiments. In the control experiment, you can see Mendelian segregation of the various genotypes, but when you inject the morpholino, you can see that out of 32 injected embryos, fewer than eight of them are, in fact, showing a phenotype. And you can, of course, then look at this retrospectively after you've genotyped the embryos, go back to the pictures that you took. And this is, for example, here, a wild-type embryo that was injected with one nanogram of the morpholino. In this case, a mutant embryo. You can see that the mutant embryo does not show any angiogenesis phenotype. We're looking here at the formation of these vessels here in the trunk that form through angiogenesis, the so-called intersomatic vessels. And you can see clear phenotype in the wild-type, but not in the mutant. So essentially, we have this situation where the mutants do not show a severe phenotype, but if you inhibit translation, you see a severe phenotype. This is by now using these morphonino antisense. What about now if you inhibit transcription? What will you see? And the way we did this, inhibiting transcription, was take advantage again of a recently developed technique called CRISPR interference, and we're using now a dead version of Cas9, the one that doesn't have nuclease activity, to block transcription. And so here are the experiments first to show that, in fact, we can uh, block transcription to about 50% uh, level. And so here are uh, guides uh, used against uh, both the template and non-template strands. And in fact, when you use uh, this approach, you can phenocopy the morphine-induced phenotypes, or the morphine-like phenotypes. So again, these are, again, control and two experimental, and you can see uh, defects in the intersomatic vessels, as uh, shown here. So what we have is a situation where the mutants don't show a phenotype, but if you use morphonine to, to block translation, or you use this uh, CRISPR interference to block transcription, you see a severe vascular defects. So essentially, the hypothesis then became one of gene compensation. And to uh, use a classical example, one from the uh, muscular dystrophy field, when mouse uh, mutants were made for the dystrophin gene, eutrophin gene was upregulated, and so one needs to make a double uh, mutant to see the kind of phenotype that the uh, Duchenne patients exhibit. And so the hypothesis then in our case was that there was in fact the activation of a network, a compensatory network, that would buffer against the uterus mutations, and this compensation was present in mutant embryos, but not in morphins or in CRISPR-I injected embryos. And so we used then proteomics and transcriptomics to test this hypothesis. And let's look first at the proteomics. So we're comparing wild-type mutant and morphins. And what we found is essentially a single protein. This is now comparing mutant to wild-type. We found a single protein, mRNA 3 a that's upregulated in the mutant compared to the wild-type. But interestingly, this mRNA 3 a 3A was not significantly upregulated in the morphant compared to the wild type. Looking at the uh, RNA levels, we found, in fact, not only mRNA 3A, but uh, other family members, including mRNA 3B and mRNA 2A. And you can see, again, that they are upregulated in the mutant compared to the wild type, but not in the morphant. Similarly, when we use CRISPR-I, we did, not see, we did not see a regulation of these genes, I mean, 3A, 3A, 3B, and 2A. What are these amylin genes? Uh, we know, in fact, that uh, like uh, EGFR7, amylins are negative regulators of allostogenesis, and uh, one of the main and uh, functional domain of uh, EGFR7, shown here in yellow, is, in fact, an EMI domain, and this uh, name, EMI, uh, comes, in fact, from the amylin genes. Now, are these genes, the upregulation of these eminent genes, in fact, important functionally? And does it, can it explain, in fact, the lack of phenotypes in the EGFR7 mutants? 
and the way we uh, address this uh, question is by essentially making uh, EGFR7 morphins and then rescuing them with uh, wild type as well as mutant EGFR7 as well as uh, MLN2 and MLN3. And as you can see here, again, this is now the uh, number of effect in green. We're looking at the uh, phenotypically normal embryos, which are few uh, when you inject the EGFR7 mor morphinino. When you come in with EGFR7 RNA uh, for rescue, you can see that this uh, uh, frequent number uh, frequency increases. If you use a mutant version of EGFR7, you fail to rescue. And again, much like wild type EGFR7, you can partially rescue the EGFR7 morphine phenotype by using this MNN2 and MNN3 genes. This uh, compensation phenomenon that uh, we observed in zebrafish, this difference between knockout and knockdown uh, or morphant and mutant, mutant and morphant uh, embryos, is also observed in yeast. There was a recent study from Orion Weiner's lab where they looked at the BEM1 gene. If you look at the mutation in BEM1, as you can see here, essentially it causes a very minor phenotypes. Now, but now if you use optogenetics to drive this protein away from its site of action, then you see now a severe phenotypes, including cell cycle arrest and cell lysis. So to summarize and uh, essentially provide some outlook on these studies, clearly there are some morpholinos that uh, phenocopy mutations, at least at the morphological level, for example, chiotropin T that uh, we use extensively in part two to block contraction of the heart. There are other morpholinos that do not phenocopy mutations. So there are possible, uh, a number of possible explanations, including the fact that uh, mutant alleles could be hypomorphic, and that uh, certainly could be the case for many mutations that were induced in the 5 prime n of genes. There are going to be morpholinos that, in fact, do cause a number of off-target effects, even if used at a relatively low dose. And then, in some cases, uh, for example, as uh, we just uh, observed with EGFR7s, we're going to have compensation in the mutants, but not in the morphins. What about uh, morpholinos? How now, uh, with this in mind, and with the ability to essentially then mutate any gene using uh, Talon's CRISPR-Cas9, how should we uh, think about uh, using morpholinos? And the argument would be that, in fact, uh, to find a morpholino that causes no off-target effects, and probably the best way to do this is to find a dose and a sequence of morpholino that has no effect in the corresponding non-mutant embryos or maybe even better yet, in embryos that are lacking the morpholino binding site. Since we do see differences between the morphant and mutant phenotypes, a question, of course, arises as to which of these phenotypes is the real phenotype and which tool to use. And we would argue that, of course, both of these tools, the mutation approach as well as the morpholino or antisense approach should be used, even if they give you different answers, both of these answers could in fact be correct, especially if the anti-sense reagent has been validated previously. Now, the uh, zebrafish is particularly well suited to do this kind of work, that is to compare mutant and morphine phenotypes. And uh, one way we are thinking of using it is essentially to identify members of the network. So for example, in this context, or the context of the work I just described, you might think of uh, MLNs as being part of a network with EGFR7. And uh, MLN could, in fact, uh, because it can at least partially compensate for the lack of EGFR7, it can be, by definition, seen as a modifier gene. And so, essentially, the idea now is to take genes implicated in vascular development, vascular biology, and see if the morphins and mutants for these genes show different phenotypes. And if they do, can we identify the compensating genes and thereby uh, identify the uh, modifier genes? Now, mechanistically, there are a number, of course, of uh, interesting questions, including what are the mechanisms of this transcriptional upregulation? So, in the EGFR7 mutants, how does uh, MLN uh, transcription get upregulated? What is the trigger for this upregulation? What are the mechanisms between the trigger itself and this uh, transcriptional uh, upregulation? And so, this is uh, some of the ongoing work now in the lab. And uh, let me just give you a few slides, show you a few slides about uh, what we're doing, not only in zebrafish, but also in mammalian cells. We now have a number, identify a number of genes uh, 
where essentially we see this uh, RNA level upregulation in the power log, the non-mutated power log. And in four of these cases, we've also seen that the heterozygous embryos, as well as the mutant embryos, show, in fact, this increase in RNA levels. So for example, I've told you about, uh, in this case, uh, earlier about EGFR7 and the upregulation by, of amylin. We've also looked uh, at uh, VEGF-AA mutants, and we see upregulation of VEGF-AV. If you looked at the heterozygous embryo, again, for example, uh, looking at uh, EGFR7 right here, you can see that the heterozygous embryos show an intermediate level of upregulation compared to the mutants. And of course, here is the wild type. And similarly, VEGF AA also, heterozygous embryos also show this intermediate level of upregulation. Now, of course, we've also identified and seen, observed genes that uh, when mutated do not cause the upregulation of the power log. And some of these uh, cases are shown here. And so with that, I'll uh, thank the and acknowledge uh, the people who've been driving these projects, including the original uh, paper, uh, Rossi Contarakis et al., and also uh, Mohamed's uh, work, who is now working uh, to uh, essentially look further into this phenomenon of compensation using uh, zebrafish mutants, but also using mammalian cell lines, where we observe similar compensation uh, phenomenon, trying to see if we can get into mechanisms, again, not only to identify the trigger, but also the uh, mechanism between the trigger and the transcriptional upregulation. And I also want to thank the uh, funding buddies uh, who are supporting this work. Thank you.